Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the um, seminar, Market Calendars, What IRA Holders Should Know About in uh, Tax Year 2022. Uh, one of the reasons why we created this course is uh, so that you are aware or give you a, a heads up on what's coming up in Tax Year 2022. Some of the information we'll be covering may not apply to you, but uh, this is just a comprehensive coverage of what's coming up, so um, uh, use the information that applies to you. Uh, again, a little bit of a disclaimer, the interest group does not provide investment advice nor endorse any products. <clears throat> uh, all information and materials are purely for educational purpose purposes only. All parties are encouraged again to consult with their attorneys, accountants, financial advisors before enter entering into any type of investment. Or if you have any tax or legal questions, uh, consult with the practitioners that you're working with um, uh, for those particular types of questions. Um, the agenda for today, we're going to talk a little bit about the Antrust Group, because since we are sponsoring this particular webinar, we'll talk about 2022 dates and deadlines that you should know as an IRA holder, meaning there are forms that are going to be sent out here fairly shortly, and uh, we're going to be covering what those forms are, what it, what it means to you, uh, or not mean anything to you, but at least you know what to do with those forms, hopefully, as, as we finish this particular course. We'll take a look at the new limits. In other words, the contribution limits for tax year 2022, uh, phase out ranges that deal with IRA deductibility as well as uh, Roth contribution eligibility. In other words, in, in some of these IRAs, there is a limit on the amount of income you can receive for the year to receive a tax deduction as an example, as well as an income limit to determine whether or not you're eligible to contribute to, in this case, a Roth IRA. Uh, we'll talk about those cost of living adjustments. And last but not least, uh, we'll talk about uh, tips for the upcoming tax season. And some of you folks that may be attending this course, uh, you may be asking, what happened to all those legislation that was uh, out in the uh, press lately? We'll, we'll try to cover a little bit about what's going on uh, with those. And then we'll open up the phone lines for any questions you may have in regards to the materials presented. So as we go through this seminar, please, Jot down any questions you may have, and we'll do our best to be able to answer those questions for you. My name is John Paul Ruiz, Director of Professional Development here at the Entrust Group. And uh, enough of me. Let's talk about the material, all right? Um, the Entrust Group has about $4, $4 billion uh, under asset administration. We have 22,000 active accounts, and uh, uh, we're going on 40 years of, of servicing the self-directed world. Even though we've been around for 40 years, self-direction, or in other words, an open architecture platform like what we have uh, for you, the investor, to choose whatever investments you want to hold under your retirement plan, is still something that uh, a lot of people um, uh, do not understand. So we appreciate any, any referrals or communication to other people that may be interested in this particular type of uh, uh, platform. Uh, and the thing that makes Entrust Group different is that you do have a point of contact. We do have people that actually answer the phones and try to answer the general questions you may have. But again, if, it, if the questions are specific to you uh, as an individual, whether it be a tax or legal advice, please involve your tax or legal advisor. And we'd be more than happy to even have a conference call with them if they have any questions, because we are not licensed to offer tax advice nor legal advice, but we can give you the general information and then from there, you can work with a tax or legal professional to make your informed decision. Um, about the interest group, we are a self-directed IRA administrator. Again, as, as, I, as I said, we do have knowledgeable staff. Not only do we educate our staff, we also educate the industry. We do have uh, um, a, um, uh, what we call an IRA academy that is actually approved by the American Banking Association where not only our staff, but also other organizations attend to sit for what we call the Certified IRA Services Professional Designation through the American Banking Association. We also do have nationwide offices, so if you have a group of people that you uh, wanted to um, receive a presentation on, uh, on self-direction, please organize it, and we'd be more than happy to participate in, in, in that particular uh, type of event for you. Again, we do in-person and virtual webinars uh, if, if uh, requested, and if it's feasible to to a portion a time of one of our consultants to be able to talk about self-direction for your group, please let us know. 
Uh, again, we do have a biannual IRA Academy. One of one of the delivery mechanisms we have is through streaming, as well as we do have a live IRA Academy in uh, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, held at the Tennessee Bankers Association's location. Uh, because the Amtrust Group also ha does have a uh, another company that is uh, o um, ran by our founders of the Amtrust Group administration called the Entrust Trust Company. Now, in other words, it's a trust company that custodies the assets that are held uh, under the retirement plans and the Entrust Group. What is a self-directed retirement account? Again, it's an open architecture model, which means that we provide the document, we provide the administration, but instead of offering you the investment, since we don't offer any investments, you, the IRA holder, gets to choose what type of investments you want to hold under your account. Given the fact that you've been given that option to choose it, also comes responsibilities of providing us information so that we can administer the investment that you've chosen to hold under your um, retirement account. In, in other words, in, in a self-directed um, scenario, you're not limited to stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, which most organizations offer to you. Since the interest group does not offer anything, and we leave it up to you, the IRA holder, to vet out and choose the type of investment you want to hold in the account. Um, then you also have to gather yourself a team that would help assist you in advising you on the types of investments you should um, you know, consider. And, and ultimately, you have to make that final decision. The Antrust Group does not play that role. We just play the, the role of the custodian of the asset, as well as um, provide the compliance um, pieces that are associated with uh, having an IRA, such as administration, IRS reporting, um, so on and so forth. All securities and investments held in a retirement account are administered, uh, are, are administered and uh, last but not least, uh, by a regulated custodian or trustee, and that's where the Entrust Trust Company comes into play. I kind of gave you a high-level uh, speed Reader's Digest version of who the Entrust Group is because we have a lot of material to cover. First, let's take a look at 2022 dates and deadlines that you should know, starting off with the IRS form um, 1099-R. The IRS form 1099-R is what we call the, the distribution form that is uh, required uh, for custodians to not only report to the IRA holder who's taking a distribution from an IRA, it's also required to be reported to the IRS. The amount that is uh, notated on the 1099-R is what we call the fair market value at the time of distribution. So in other words, if we take a distribution by uh, June 30th, well, that's the amount uh, that we will report on the IRS Form 1099-R. Now, keep in mind, the 1099-R is, is sent out by January 31st. That's the deadline that um, uh, the regulations provide. There are also additional forms that are sent out on January 31st. And what that means uh, is there are these, these forms are required, such as what we call the fair market value statement. Do not confuse that with the fair market value I just recently talked about. The fair market value that I've talked about is the amount that's going to be reported in the 1099-R that should be um, notated on your own IRS Form 1040, line 4A and 4B, by the way. Depending upon what type of distribution you took, it could be taxable or non-taxable, but the IRS does want that information to be notated on your own individual tax returns. <clears throat> the fair market value that's stated on your uh, particular slide is a requirement by the, for the custodian to report the fair market value of your IRA if you still have an IRA at a custodian's um, IRA program uh, to be reported by January 31st. And that, that fair market value is the December 31st fair market value of an IRA. For those of you who are attending this course, I would assume that all of you are self-directed um, uh, IRA holders, in which case, if you chose the investment to hold under your IRA, we also then require that you provide us that information on the value of your investment so that we can report that to the IRS since it is a regulatory requirement. As a matter of fact, that is stated on Article 5 of the IRA document that you sign to establish your IRA that the grantor of the IRA, that means the IRA holder, has to provide the custodian the necessary reports to do their function. So for those of you who may have received um, you know, a request to get a fair market value, that's the reason why. For those individuals that have attained a certain age, and that age is age 72 because of the SECURE Act, 
Uh, another uh, uh, requirement for the custodian to provide those individuals is what we call a required minimum distribution statement. We have to provide you either an amount or offer you uh, the service to calculate the amount of what we call a required minimum distribution. When an individual reaches a certain age, and that age is 72 again, they're going to be forced to start depleting that IRA by a minimum amount. Focus on that word minimum. It just means a small amount. That small amount has to be distributed every year in order for the individual not to incur a penalty. The penalty is 50%. Now, keep in mind, it's always an option not to distribute the RMD and just pay the 50%. However, if you do not want to get the 50% penalty, it is essential that that amount is distributed in a timely fashion. Now, what that amount is, is reported sometimes in conjunction with a fair market value statement because the calculation of that minimum amount involves that fair market value statement. It's the fair market value statement divided by what we call a life expectancy factor. From there, once the minimum amount is uh, it's calculated and, and uh, computed, that amount is what's, what tells the IRA holder of the amount that they should distribute by the end of the year. Now keep in mind, uh, required minimum distribution amounts are, um, Required minimum distribution amounts are reported on, on January 31st, but does not have to be distributed until uh, December 31st. So make sure that you keep a copy of your fair market value statement, especially if you're over the age or have reached the age of 72 and over. The fair market value statement, again, is required for the custodians and trustees um, that are regulated to provide fair market values to the IRA holders by January 31st. Now, keep in mind, again, since the IRA holder is the one that chose the investment, you know, the custodian is going to be requesting uh, the fair market value of that investment from the IRA holder. Again, it re also reports the uh, RMD calculation in most cases, um, uh, depending upon the institution that you're working with, since they both have the same deadline. Now, if you're a client of the Entrust Group uh, in the portal uh, that you may have signed up for, you can actually get your statement there as well, which should include uh, your required minimum distribution if you're the age of 72 and older. Um, the uh, amount, again, could come from the IRA holder, and some, sometimes you may have to request that from the investment provider, such as if you've invested in what we call a private placement, or if you've invested in a business, is a partnership or an LLC, try to acquire that valuation from uh, the investment provider. And, and most of the time, it's the chief financial officer or the accountant of that of that uh, investment that you invested in. And that's what we use to report the fair market value on an individual's IRA. Now, required minimum distributions, again, are those amounts that must be distributed by December 31st of every year once a person reaches the magical age of uh, 72. Uh, there's a notice called Notice 2002-27 from, from the IRS that requires trustees and custodian to provide a statement to an IRA holder that has an RMD due for that particular year um, so that the IRA holder may have assistance, whether it be an amount or uh, the custodian may, may offer that, you know, if you want us to calculate your RMD for the year, uh, we can do so, but you need to contact us. Now, I'm going to give you some tools on where you can also go to calculate your RMD. Uh, there is a section of the Securities, Securities and Exchange Commission's uh, a website. The S, it'll be SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC.gov. That's the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, a portion of their website called investor.gov, um, it's like an invest, somebody investing, investor.gov, which provides educational materials for investors to educate themselves on different types of investments. Under that section of that website, uh, investor.gov, there are calculators in there, one of which the, one, one calculator they have in there is what we call an RMD calculator. So if you're not sure of what your RMD is going to be, or you want to project what your RMD is going to be, take your fair market value statement and find out what that amount is. Go to investor.gov, plug in the numbers, and that's another way to be able to get an RMD amount if your custodian does not have enough information to calculate that for you, including the Entrust group. Sometimes individuals may have transferred their IRA from one institution to the other, so the receiving institution does not have that fair market value, so therefore they can't calculate the RMD. You can calculate it yourself based on the information 
uh, that you may have received from other financial institutions using a calculator again under the government's website investor.gov and there's an RMD calculator there that could help assist you in calculating the, the true amount of your RMD to avoid the 50% penalty. Again, the 1099-R reports any distributions from an individual's IRA for a particular year. Now, not all distributions are taxable. So just because you received the 1099-R doesn't mean it's automatically taxable. Certain uh, uh, distributions such as recharacterizations are not taxable. What that is is that if somebody contributed to a traditional IRA and they moved it to a Roth because they changed their mind on the type of contribution, uh, as long as it's done before their tax return due date plus extensions, that transaction is not taxable. But for other transactions that are taxable, pay close attention to the 1099-R because that amount needs to be in included in your tax return when you file your tax return. It's line 4A and 4B. Now, depending upon whether or not you set aside a portion of that distribution uh, to pay the tax liability for that distribution, uh, will determine whether or not you need to include that IRS Form 1099-R with your tax return. In other words, if, if uh, an amount was, was set, set aside for the taxation, the, the, the name for that, by the way, is what we call withholding. If something was withheld from your distribution, it doesn't mean you paid taxes on it already. In other words, you're just setting aside a portion, and hopefully there is enough taxes that you've set aside to pay the tax liability on that particular distribution. That is reported on box four of the IRS Form 1099-R. I get questions all the time. Does the 1099-R need to be filed with the IRS Form 1040 when, when, uh, when I file my tax return? The answer is it depends. It depends upon whether or not there's anything on box four. The amount on box four proves to the IRS the amount that has already been sent in on behalf of the person who took a distribution. Now, if you may be thinking, doesn't the IRS know that amount? The answer is they don't. Because when, when uh, people who process distributions send in amounts withheld from all their distributions, they send one big check. So the amount of withholding on an IRS form 1099-R box four is the only proof that the IRS has of the amount that has been sent on behalf of that specific taxpayer. So again, if somebody take, took a distribution uh, by January 31st of this year, those 1099-Rs will now be, um, be, be sent from all financial institutions on or before January 31st. And take a look at that 1099-R to see if it's taxable or not. And then from there, um, incorporate that amount in your tax return. Of course, that's where the assistance of a competent tax advisor would come into play if you're not familiar with how to complete your your tax return, all right? Again, 1099-Rs report distributions, both taxable and non-taxable, but the ones that are taxable, if you had withholding, that will show up on box four, so that that amount could show as a prepayment of taxes already. Again, whether or not it's enough or not, that depends upon how much income you had for the year, and that could be discussed with your tax or legal advisor. All right, now, there are also certain deadlines for businesses. Why is that important? Because some people who own IRAs are actually businesses that contribute to what we call employer-sponsored plans, IRA-based employer-sponsored plans to be specific for this course. <clears throat> and those specific plans include your SEP plans, your simple plans, and the deadline to establish and contribute for SEP simples, as well as I'm going to add another one to that, it's called your individual 401k plan. Uh, in other words, uh, a 401k plan with no rank and file employees, it only, it only uh, allows for, you know, uh, it, employers itself do not have employees. They're only, they're entrepreneurs that just work for themselves and partners or their spouses. Those particular, these particular types of small business plans, your SEPs, your SIMPLES, your individual 401k plans, uh, the determination of when it could be established and where the employer when the employer contributions must be made is dependent upon the ta the employer's tax return due date plus extensions. First, let's take a look at the tax return due date for S corporations as well as uh, partnerships. So, well, for S corporations and partnerships, the deadline to make a contribution, in this case, also to establish a SEP plan and an individual 401k plan is March 15th. So, if they have a SEP plan and an individual 401k plan, not a simple, 
but if they already have one established and they need to make a contribution, that deadline is March 15th. Now for SEPs and individual 401k plans, they can also establish the plan by March 15th and fund it at the same time. For simple plans, the simple plan had to have been established by October 1st of the previous year, but March 15th is the deadline for when they need to make that employer contribution. I know it's a lot of information, that's why jot any questions down you may have. So again, for SEP and individual 401k plans, not only can they establish it, they can also fund it. Uh, keep in mind, there, there are a, a, a ton of assets that could be contributed to these accounts. And what that means is, how would you like to make a contribution to your retirement plan that you get to keep under your name, but also reduce the amount of taxes you'll have to pay as a business? In other words, by that, that contribution will reduce the amount of taxes, but you get to contribute that to your own account and get to keep it too? That's the benefit of what we call an employer-sponsored plan. So if you're an employer or have a small business and you've never established a small business plan, this may be the, the route that you may want to consider. Uh, there's an IRS form publication, uh, IRS publication, publication 560. If you want to Google it, uh, read up on it. And it talks about the SEP, the simple, and an individual 401k plan uh, for those individuals that uh, are interested in those types of plans. And ask those questions too today. Um, during the time, the Q&A time. <clears throat> now, April 1st is significant for RMD purposes because generally the deadline for an RMD is December 31st. However, if an individual turns 72 in 2021, they can actually postpone their first year's RMD and, and only their first year's RMD up until April 1st of the year following, which means April 1st of 2022. Uh, now, keep in mind, if they postpone their first year's RMD, what, what they need to uh, uh, realize is that they also have another one due by December 31st of 2022, because that's the general deadline for every tax year on when an RMD is due. So in other words, you can either distribute it by December 31st of every year. However, if you postpone your first year, you've got to that subsequent year. Why is that significant? Because now it doubles the amount that's going to be taxed for that particular year of distribution, which means tax consequences, which means if you didn't prepare for it, you might wanna to talk to your tax, your tax advisor in regards to how much tax should I set aside from this distribution or how much should I withhold from this distribution so that you have the, enough money to be able to pay the tax on that particular distribution. Now, on the month of April, April 15th is also a significant deadline because that's the individual's tax return due date, which means that is also the deadline to make a contribution. Now keep in mind, under the SECURE Act, for traditional IRAs in the past, if you wanted to make a contribution, you could not have been 70 and a half because that was, a, that was a restriction. With the passage of the SECURE Act, the age limit to make a traditional IRA contribution is no longer there. So in other words, the only requirement is you must have earned income. So if you have earned income, regardless of how old you are, you can contribute to either both a traditional or Roth, or both, as long as you're eligible to contribute to either one or both. And that deadline to make that contribution is April 15th. Now, April 15th is also the deadline for um, uh, sole proprietors as well as C corporations. So in other words, if you have a sole proprietor or C and or a C corporation, and they don't have an employer-sponsored plan for tax year 2021, not only can they establish a SEP plan, they can also establish an individual 401k plan and make the employer contribution by April 15th. Unless, of course, they applied for an extension, which means the deadline would be further along later on. Now, this is also the same deadline to recharacterize a current year contributions. In other words, if you made a contribution to one type of IRA and you go, oops, I really didn't want to make a contribution to that type of IRA. The IRS says, yeah, if you change your mind, as long as you haven't filed your taxes, we'll just move it. That transaction is what we call a recharacterization. A current year contribution that has been being changed from one type of IRA to another. Now, you can recharacterize all or only a portion of that contribution. So let's say you made a $6,000 contribution and you said, you know what, I would have been better off making that additional three to the Roth IRA. Well, the IRA says, just move that 3,000 to the Roth along with the earnings that it earned in the traditional as if you made the original contribution 
to the rod. Again, that transaction is what we call a recharacterization. Now, for individuals who made too much of a contribution to their IRA, in other words, they're not, they made a contribution that they weren't eligible to contribute, April 15th is also the deadline to distribute that what we call excess contribution along with its earnings. So again, these are just high-level overviews of significant dates so that if you do run across a particular issue, whether it be contributed too much or contributed to the wrong IRA, these are significant milestones in 2022 that you need to meet in order for you to be able to make those changes. That's April of 2022. Now let's take a look at May. May is also a significant month because this is the month were the general 5498s for not only IRAs, but also maybe your health savings accounts are going to be issued <coughs> by your custodian, not only to you, but to, all, to also the IRS. In other words, if you made a contribution, this is your proof that you actually made a contribution. So if you made a traditional IRA contribution, that'll show up on the uh, box one of your IRS form 5498. If you've made a Roth contribution, as an example, that will show up on box 10 of the IRS form 5498. And don't be surprised if you receive multiple 5498s, because for every document that you've completed at a financial institution, it generally does require a 5498 per IRA and per type of IRA that you've established at a financial institution. Now, again, this also goes for your HSAs. This is uh, what what is uh, used to report to the taxpayer that, hey, I made an HSA contribution, it's reported on um, 5498s. However, if, if it's uh, an HSA uh, contribution that was uh, done through an employer, that will also show up on the 5498 SA. So you may have to acquire that from uh, the, um, uh, uh, the HSA provider and some of them are like Health Equity or Bank of America has an HSA program, Wells Fargo, wherever it may be that the contribution is being made, that, that's when the 5498SA is generated and reported not only to you, the taxpayer, but also uh, to the IRS. Again, keep these, keep these uh, forms, records, especially Roth, since uh, we, when, when you make a Roth contribution, it's not used as a tax deduction, this is your proof later on when you're trying to reconcile distributions. You don't want to pay taxes again on those contributions, and this is your proof. It's called the IRS Form 5498. Now, for education savings accounts, which there's not as many of them around anymore, education savings accounts are some people who are still contributing to it. What if you contributed too much? In other words, the maximum contribution is 2000 for the year. And both grandparents, let's say, made contributions on behalf of their grandchild's education savings account. In other words, they have an excess contribution. The deadline to remove that excess contribution is June 1st or the first day of the sixth month following the calendar year. So in other words, I don't know, I, I, I get it. Why don't they just say June 1st? But that's what the regulations say. So for tax year 2021, if somebody over contributed, it has to be removed by <clears throat> the first day of the sixth month following the calendar year. In other words, June 1st. Again, this is only for education savings accounts that received an excess contribution. Now, let's move on to September. September 15th and September 30th are significant deadlines. First, let's take a look at September 15th. As you may recall, we have those S corporations as well as partnerships that have a deadline of, of March 15th to file their tax return and also establish a SEP as well as individual 401k plan and make contributions for those types of plans. Now. Uh, uh, March 15th would all have also been the deadline to make employer contributions for simple plans that were established in tax year 2021. Now, if an, if, uh, an employer file, physically filed for a tax extension, and that means they filed the IRS form 4868. Again, it's the IRS form 4868. It's an automatic six months extension application. In other words, Uncle Sam, I know the deadline is March 15th. I need some more time. Well, they filed the IRS form 4868 to buy themselves six months to complete their tax return. Well, that six month falls on September 15th. This is the deadline for S corporations and partnerships that apply for an extension. This is also the same deadline again to establish and fund a SEP or individual 401k plan. For those employers or entrepreneurs that do not have an employer sponsored plan, 
that's the time to establish one and fund it. Now, September 30th is um, uh, a significant date. Why is that? It's actually October 1st. Let, let, let's put it this way, October 1st. October 1st is a typical deadline to establish a, um, a simple plan for the tax year. Uh, let me explain why that is. A simple plan means that contributions are coming from the employees as well as the employer. But given the fact that uh, a simple plan contribution comes from an employee, in other words, a deferral of taxation from their paycheck, in other words, amounts being deducted from their paycheck is contributed to a simple plan. Now imagine if an employer establishes a simple plan by December 31st. How can employees defer into that plan that they just have established when December 31st is when they establish the plan? Well, that's why there's a prohibition of establishing a simple plan during a calendar year past a certain date. In other words, the IRS says, you gotta give your employees at least a little bit of time to be able to contribute to the simple plan. And so that's what we call a short plan year. In other words, a short time to allow for employees to participate in the plan. And that period is three months. The typical deadline to establish a simple plan for a particular calendar year is October 1st of that calendar year. So in other words, for tax year 2022, the deadline to establish a simple plan for an existing employer is October 1st. However, October 1st falls on a weekend. That's why we have September 30th. So in order for uh, an employer to have a simple plan for tax year 2022, they need to establish that simple plan, meaning they need to sign that document as well as the, the, uh, the appointed custodian or, uh, or what we call the designated financial institution to sign that document as well, that those, that's where the simple plan is established. That deadline again is September 30th, September 30th, although the general deadline is October 1st, but since October 1st falls on a weekend, that's why we have that September 30th deadline. Again, if you have any questions, please jot those questions down. Now for sole proprietors and C corporations, if they apply for an extension using the 48, form 4868, that's their deadline six months from there is October 17th. October 17th is generally October 15th, but again, if it falls on a weekend or a holiday, it's the following business day that uh, they, uh, uh, these extensions fall under. October 17, 2022 is the deadline for employers that file for an extension for their tax year 2021's tax return. Again, this is also the deadline since they file for a tax return extension to not only establish and fund a SEP and individual 401k plans employer contribution. Now for October 31st, this is when uh, this is when uh, uh, trustees and custodians may be sending out a letter to those simple plans that um, have been already established at their financial institution. Given the fact that in, uh, employees that participate in the simple plan must be given a notice on what the employer's contribution is going to be, uh, no no later than sixty days prior to the beginning of a of a tax year. Now this is not establishment. This is a notice. The notice must be provided for these employees to determine whether or not they want to participate in the plan. They have to be given 60 days prior to the beginning of the, uh, of the um, uh, following plan year, in other words, 2023, um, on whether or not they want to participate or not. But October 31st is when trustees would send out these mailers. Why is that? Because if the employer is responsible to provide this notice no later than 60 days prior to the beginning of the plan year, which puts it on, which puts it on uh, November 2nd, well, the employer must receive some, some information so that they can have the forms to provide their employees of these notices. The trustees and custodians have an ultimate deadline of sending this information out by October 31st. Hopefully, the employers receive it by November 1st enough time to be able to present that to their employees by November 2nd. Again, it's, it's a pretty tight window, but that's what the regulations say, and that's why we have it on the presentation. Right. November 2nd, 60 days before the following plan year again, is when employees must receive the notices. If, if, uh, if you have a simple plan and uh, you are uh, gonna continue to maintain that simple plan for tax year 2023, November 2nd, 
of 2022 is when the employers must provide the employee of what amount they're going to contribute on behalf of the simple plan, as well as whether or not they're even going to maintain a simple plan for the following calendar year. Now, this is internal. Um, since given the fact that earlier I told you that the fair market value statement must be provided um, to the IRS, since we are a self-directed administrator, we have to have certain deadlines to receive documentation so that we can physically incorporate that in that particular December 31st um, deadline to produce that you know, fair market value statement. That's why the interest group requires that um, uh, November 11th is when we need to receive the, that valuation of that investment that you've chosen so that we can give us enough time to be able to incorporate that in our records and actually have that amount uh, show on what we call the fair market value statement as well as the IRS form 5498. Now, December 30th is also a significant date. Why? Because that is also the date or that is also the month in which required minimum distributions are due. Given the fact that uh, the general deadline to distribute an RMD is December 31st of a particular year, and it's not a tax act, it's just a requirement to distribute that amount to avoid the 50% the penalty. Well, what if December 31st falls on a weekend? Well, it does not get the following business day because it, it's not a tax act, it's just a required amount to be distributed. Since December 31st falls at a weekend, well, the RMDs, if you have an RMD that needs to be distributed, make sure that it makes it, you make, you know, you, you get your requests into the financial institution way before um, the deadline, which in this 2020, tax year 2022, the deadline is December 30th because December 31st falls on a weekend or a holiday, right? And that's for your traditional IRAs, your SEPs, your SIMPLES, as well as if you're an employer, if there's an RMD due, that's the deadline for it. And it's a qualification issue. In other words, it's a big deal in a 401k plan if an RMD is not distributed. It could even cause plan, a plan to be dis disqualified. Now, keep in mind, if you don't know how to calculate an RMD, there's that investor.gov website that the government has that actually has what we call an RMD calculator. Now, the next bullet point in this particular slide deals with what we call beneficiaries. If somebody died in 2021, these beneficiary accounts to make sure that they're reported correctly to the IRS must be established no later than the end of the following year of death. In other words, if somebody died in 2021, these accounts must be established by the end of the following year. And that puts us at December 30th as well. So. Um, I don't know how many beneficiaries are attending this course, but if you're a beneficiary, you need to notify um, the interest group quickly on uh, whether or not an IRA holder has passed away so that we uh, can assist you in establishing these what we call inherited IRA accounts at the interest group. Uh, moving forward here. Okay. Now let's take a look at new contribution limits for tax year 2022. Now, we talked about all the forms. We talked about the, the new contribution limits. For traditional IRA and Roth IRAs, there has been no change in the contribution limit for tax year 2022. So the maximum amount is still 6000 for someone who is under the age of 50 and uh, for someone who is 50 and over. In other words, even if you're 49 right now, as long as you're going to have a birthday at the end of the year, before at any time be, before the end of the year, that means you're going to be 50 during the calendar year, you can make this additional contribution called a catch-up contribution. So not only will you have the limit of 6,000, you will have a limit of 7,000 if you're 50 and over, as long as you have enough earned income to support it. Now the rule states that uh, you, know, you have to have earned income. What is earned income? Wages for services performed. Some people may have uh, a taxable income, but it's not considered earned income because the income is passive. What does that mean? It's an interest or dividend income, or it, it may be um, a rental income. Those aren't considered earned income. You have to have earned income to contribute to an IRA. And the maximum, again, is 6000 for tax year 2021, as, as well as to tax year 2022 separately. The catch-up contribution also requires earned income. That amount is $1,000. So 7000 for 
an individual is 50 and over for both tax year 2021 and tax year 2022. Now, another issue that individuals may be looking at is, is my contribution tax deductible if it's a traditional IRA? Now, the answer is it really depends. It depends upon whether or not you're already covered by an employer-sponsored plan. What does that mean? If a contribution went into your account, whether it be you made your own contribution or an employer made a contribution on your behalf, if you're an employee, well, it means you're covered by an employer-sponsored plan. Or if you're self-employed and you have a 401k plan, as an example, or a SEP or a SIMPLE, and you're contributing to that plan, it means you're covered. What does that mean? You're, you're, the level of your modified adjusted gross income will determine whether or not your uh, contribution is deductible or not. Let's take a look at tax year 2021 and, and illustrate to you how that works. All right? The phase out range, in other words, the more income you have, it phases you out of being able to use your contribution as a tax deduction, is as follows. For a single filer, it's 66 to 76. What does that mean? If your income is less than 66,000, that means that your contribution is fully deductible regardless of whether or not you're covered by what we call an employer-sponsored plan. The moment your income starts to exceed 66,000, it starts to reduce or phase out your eligibility for a deduction. For a deduction. In other words, if your modified adjusted gross income is over 76,000, you cannot deduct your contribution at all. For every thousand that goes over 66,000, it reduces your IRA contributions deductibility if you're a single filer by 10%. For every thousand, it's 10%. So in other words, if the maximum contribution for someone who's under the age of 50 is 6,000, and they made 67,000 as their modified adjusted gross income, well, then they can only deduct up to 5,400. In other words, the 6,000 less than 10%. If they make 68,000, reduce another $600 from that $6,000 contribution. Now, where can they put that amount that's not deductible? Well, they can either put it in the IRA itself. In other words, they're making a non-deductible contribution, which means they may want to track it so that when it comes out, it's not taxed again or they can also put it in another type of IRA called a Roth IRA. We'll get to the, the income limits later on once we get to the Roth portion. Now keep in mind again, the whole premise of this particular chart is just to show you what the income levels are to determine whether or not contributions are deductible. Now let's take a look at a married couple filing a joint tax return for tax year 2021. Under 105, fully deductible. The moment it exceeds 105, it starts to decrease the eligibility for this individual to deduct their contribution as a tax deduction. Over 125, no deduction at all. For a married couple filing a joint tax return, however, for every thousand that goes over that bottom threshold, it reduces their deductibility by 5%. Now, if we have a married couple filing a separate tax return, it's zero to 10,000. Why is that? They almost make it impossible, almost. They almost make it impossible. Why? Because a couple sometimes file a separate tax return to save on taxes. When they run the numbers, if they're filing a separate tax return, they may already getting a, be getting a tax break. And Uncle Sam says you can't have your cake and eat it too. See, so if you're a married couple filing a separate tax return, in other words, you're getting a tax benefit from that, they reduce the eligibility to deduct your contribution by lowering down the phase out range between zero and 10,000. Now, what if somebody is covered by an employer-sponsored plan but is married to another person who is not covered by an employer-sponsored plan? Well, i got some bad news for you. The person who is not covered by an employer-sponsored plan is now considered covered by an employer-sponsored plan by virtue of marriage. In other words, the spouse of an active participant in an employer-sponsored plan is considered to be active as well. However, the phase-out range for that individual is much higher. It's 198 to 208. In other words, let me give you an example. Let's say a married couple has um, $154,000 of modified adjusted gross income. And using these charts for tax year 2021, that tells us that for the spouse who is covered by an employer-sponsored plan, they cannot use their contribution as a tax deduction. Again, their two options are they can either make a non-deductible contribution and keep track of those contributions using an IRS form. This IRS form is called the IRS Form 8606. 
You can Google it. Google it to, and, and get it from the IRS website so you can take a look at it. The IRS Form 8606 will keep track of the non-deductible contributions made to a traditional IRA. The custodian does not keep track of that. It's the taxpayer's responsibility. And, uh, at 154, let's, let's take a look at the spouse of an active participant. The spouse of an active participant is, let's say, not covered. So therefore, the 105 to 125 does not apply to them. However, the 198 to 208 does apply to them. If the uh, couple's earn, or modified adjusted gross income is 154 in this example, that tells us that the spouse of the active participant can still use that traditional IRA as a deduction on their income tax return, whereas the other spouse cannot, the other one can. That's kind of generally how it works. We're kind of going really fast on this because all we're trying to do is explain to you the concept. So if you have any questions, chat with your competent uh, legal advisor in regards to your own particular situation. For tax year 2022, the numbers are slightly higher because of cost of living adjustments. Now, again, use this chart to kind of eyeball whether or not you can get a deduction or not, and also make a decision on whether or not it is better for you to contribute to a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA, and that will all be a big determining factor would be whether or not you can actually use your contribution as a tax deduction or not, all right? For Roth IRAs, the application of the phase-out range is a little bit different. The phase-out range or the income limit in when it comes to a Roth IRA determines whether or not an individual can actually contribute. Another way I, I tell people when I teach all over the country is it, to contribute to a Roth IRA, you can't be rich. Well, what does it mean to be rich? Well, this chart will tell you who's rich, okay? So in other words, for a single filer, if your modified adjusted gross income exceeds 140, Congress says you're too rich. In other words, you can't contribute to a Roth. But can you still contribute to a traditional? The answer is yes. The only determining factor would be whether or not you can use that contribution as a deduction or not. For a married couple filing a joint tax return, uh, 208 is the higher threshold in tax year 2021, which means if your uh, modified adjusted, adjusted gross income exceeds 208,000, you're rich. What if your income is between 198 and 208 as an example again? So let's say the income is um, um, let's say uh, I'm using a hypothetical situation. Let's say let's say the income is uh, 203. Let's say the married couple filing a joint tax return has a modified adjusted gross income of 203,000. Well, where, where does 203 fall in relation to 198 and 208? Right in between or in the middle. Another word for that is 50%. What that means is that if their income falls between 198 and 208, they can, make, they can only make a partial contribution to their Roth. So if they're eligible for a $6,000 contribution since they're under age 50, well, then they can only make a $3,000 contribution to the Roth. Well, what happens to the other three? Well, they can definitely consider the traditional IRA. Again, those are the types of uh, information you would have to go through to determine the type of contribution as well as the amount of contribution that you may be eligible to contribute from year to year. Again, uh, talk to a tax advisor. Here's another resource. The back of the IRS form um, 1040 may have a worksheet in regards to calculating your, your IRA contribution as well as the IRS website. There is a step-by-step -step process to determine how much you can contribute to uh, traditionals as well as Roth IRA. So those are resources that will help assist you in determining uh, what you're eligible for and what you can deduct so on and so forth to determine should I contribute to a traditional or should I contribute to a Roth or maybe I, I can contribute a little bit to a Roth and a little bit to a traditional. That's really up to you. But these are the types of informations, uh, information that is necessary to determine whether or not, uh, you know, how you how to make an informed decision. That's what I was trying to say. All right. Employer-sponsored plan contribution limits. For simple IRAs for tax year 2021 and 22, uh, there has been a significant change. Deferrals, in other words, these are the employees' contributions. It's 13,500 for tax year 2021 and 14,000 for tax year 2022. An additional catch-up contribution for individuals that are 50 and over is 3,000. 
And the total contribution, if over age 50, is 16,500 for tax year 2021 and 17,000 for tax year 2022, assuming that their income will support this level of contribution. For SEP plans, which the deadline is the tax return due date plus extensions of an employer. Again, if it's a uh, S corporation or a partnership, the deadline is March 15th with an ultimate deadline of uh, September 15th if they applied for an extension. The maximum is 58,000 for tax year 2021 and 61,000 for tax year 2022. Assuming, of course, they have enough compensation uh, because it, the maximum contribution is the lesser of 25% of compensation or 58,000 again for 2021 and uh, 61,000 for tax year 2022. Now the $650 compensation limit means that in the given year, the might have uh, individuals may have seasonal employees or part-time employees that that did that does not make enough money. Um, uh, for the particular year. Well, an employer could actually contractually by the document exclude them from receiving a contribution by by de defining the amount of compensation they must have received for the year to receive a contribution. That limit is 650 for tax year 2021 and two tax, tax year 2022. The amount of income an individual to determine the 25% is also capped. It's, two, it's 290,000 for tax year 2021 and 305,000 for tax year 2022. Again, if you have any questions on this, there's a publication, publication 560. There, there is a wonderful worksheet that will can walk uh, an employee through on how to determine the contribution amount as well as chat with your tax advisor. An individual 401k plan has similar limits to a SEP, uh, SEP plan. It's 58,000 again for the employer contribution called a profit sharing contribution and 61,000 for tax year 2022. There's also another component on that is called a deferral. The deferral is 19,500 for tax year 2021 and 20,500 for tax year 2022. If a person is age 50 and over, they can make an additional 6,500 for each of the corresponding years as well. It's called a catch-up contribution. Health savings accounts. For health savings account uh, participants, the maximum amount of contribution will, deter, will be determined by the type of coverage you have uh, called a high deductible health plan. If you have only single coverage, the maximum contribution for tax year 2021 is 3,600 and 3,650 for tax year 2022. However, if you have a family coverage, a family high deductible health plan, the maximum is 7,200 for tax year 2021 and 7,300 for tax year 2022. Now, if the individual is age, um, uh, anyway, of age to make a catch-up contribution, and I believe it's age uh, 55, uh, so there's a typo on the on the screen. It should be age 55. That maximum amount is $1,000 for the, the catch-up contribution. So, again, the catch-up contribution is only available for someone who is age 55, all right? Education savings account contribution limits does not change because it's, it's kind of hard coded on the on the tax law. The maximum amount of education savings account contributions are two thousand for tax year two thousand and twenty one and tax year two thousand two thousand twenty two. Hard to say that word thousand. Um, so it's two thousand for each one of the corresponding years. All right. Here are some tips for um, for uh, upcoming for tax year two thousand twenty two. If you've ever made non deductible contributions to an IRA. Make sure that you bring out that IRS form 8606 because if you have a distribution from an IRA, a portion of that distribution shouldn't be taxed if the portion have, was tracked using the IRS form 8606. The typical codes on, on box seven of the IRS form 1099R is code one if an individual is under the age of 59 and a half, code four. If an individual is a beneficiary and code seven, if an individual is above the age of 59 and a half, which means that the distribution is could be subject to tax, but exempt from the 10% early distribution penalty, another, another excise tax, all right? <clears throat> For a Roth IRA, uh, the distribution could either be qualified or non-qualified. What that means, 
to be qualified is as follows. Let's take a look at the next slide. In order for a distribution to be completely tax-free from a Roth IRA, the IRA holder must, had a, must have had a Roth for five years, as well as one of the four qualifying events. They either had to be dead, which they don't want that to happen. They could be disabled. They could be 59 and a half, as well as up to $10,000 of the earnings, as long as they've had a Roth for five years, is being used for first-time home buyer. Well, that distribution of the earnings is tax-free. Why only the earnings? Because the contributions were never used as a tax deduction, so those are all tax-free and penalty-free at any time. When we're dealing with a qualified distribution from a Roth, we're only dealing with the earnings. In order for the earnings, again, to be tax-free, it has to be qualified. And what you're seeing on your screen are the qualifying factors to determine the earnings to be tax-free. Now, for those individuals who also have what we call um, um, uh, assets that have what we call unrelated business income tax, such as if an employer invests in a business, that income of that business that's being passed on to the IRA, if it's trade or business income, is taxable to the IRA. That Those may be required when you have partnerships or, or LLCs, as an example. Uh, the IRA will need to acquire its own EIN, and it's fairly simple to acquire an EIN. Call the interest group, and we'll walk you through how to get an EIN from the IRS. But that, those amounts, that, um, that uh, if the gross receipt or gross income of that IRA exceeds 1000 bucks, the IRA has to file the IRS Form 990-T, and the uh, the interest group does not file an IRA or prepare an IRS Form 990-T. You might have to go to a tax advisor to prepare that IRS Form 990-T for that IRA that has taxable income. Another type of investment could be what we call a leveraged investment. In other words, the IRA actually borrowed money using a, what we call a non-recourse loan. Depending upon the proportion of what was borrowed and not borrowed will determine the proportion, proportion and amount of the income that's received by that IRA that is taxable. So in other words, let's say an IRA buys a $200,000 piece of property, but they only had $100,000 in the IRA, which means they borrowed the remaining portion, and in this case, 50-50. If the IRA investment earned $20,000 for the year, well, that tells us that $10,000 of the income is generally not taxable, but the other 10 will be taxable, given the fact that they borrowed 50% of the, the money to be able to purchase that property. And that is uh, filed or or, or communicated to the IRS using what we call the IRS Form 990-T, all right? Again, this is, again, for leveraged investments. Another term for that taxable income is unrelated debt financed income. And again, the IRS Form 990-T must be filed. The deadline to file the IRS Form 990-T for IRAs is April 15th. Uh, and the, the, the rates in which a uh, trust or an IRA is taxed are trust tax rates. It's a little bit different than individual rates. So, again, check with your competent tax or legal advisor to make sure that this form is filed appropriately and timely to avoid any penalties for your IRA. All right. Investments not subject to UBIT or UBTI are corporate uh, stocks, dividends, uh, rental property, uh, mineral rights, royalties as well as capital gains or disposition of property of assets that are that are purchased outright by an IRA. In other words, they didn't use a loan. But any investments that are leveraged or the IRA use uh, borrowed money to purchase, that proportion that portion is subject to what we call unrelated debt financed income. Right? This is what the IRS Form 990T looks like for tax year 2021. An unrelated debt finance income is uh, on uh, line seven of part one of the um, IRS Form 990-T. Now, the Biden administration did, does require these 990-Ts to be filed electronically. So although it's prepared and signed by the interest group as a custodian, given the fact that you want, you know, you, you approve, read the document, approve it, then we can sign it on behalf of your IRA, it still has to be sent in electronically by a tax preparer. So you may have to have that additional tax preparer step when it comes to um, filing this 990-T. Well, st stay updated with the laws. A lot of people have asked us, um, you know, are those proposed changes that we've seen in the newspaper, so on, did it, did it come to fruition? The answer is no. 
the Build Back Better um, legislation, which incorporated some of the changes that were proposed to IRAs, uh, did not pass. So therefore, no effects on IRAs today. And I don't see that affecting, uh, I wouldn't say that, who knows, right? So we're, we're, we're coming into a, another uh, legislative cycle, in other words, election year. Let's, let's see what happens. Uh, moving forward, but at least know the Build Back Better um, bill did not pass, and none of those are affecting your IRAs today. Well, let's summarize. Mark your calendars of that significant deadlines. If it applies to you, make sure that you act upon those particular deadlines, like RMDs, you know, tax return due dates plus extensions for establishing as well as contributing. Uh, know your limits if you're going to make a contribution. Take your time with taxes. Keep in mind, you have an opportunity to extend your tax return if you're a business. And also stay updated on laws uh, because, um, because these tax laws could affect your IRAs. We try to provide these educational opportunities to keep you abreast of uh, what's new and what could affect your IRAs moving forward. Man, that's a lot of information. Uh, what's next? We have upcoming webinars. And if you want to learn something new, let us know on your survey. Again, I apologize that there's a lot of information on this thing uh, in this in this particular seminar, but we have to give that to you. Uh, there is a recording, so just in case you wanted to uh, uh, listen to it again. Now, let's open up the phone lines for about 10 to 15 minutes for any questions you may have in regards to the material presented. Andrew? Hey, JP. Thank you very much for that great presentation. We do have some questions here. And without okay. further ado, let's dive right in. Okay. Question one is about legislation. So in late mm -hmm. summer, there was a notice that there was proposals out to disallow private placements in IRAs. Mm -hmm. Is this yep. still being considered? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, that, that proposal was actually provided by what we call the Health Committee, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, uh, headed up by Richard Neal. And one of the one of the provisions or the sections of that uh, a provision is any time um, um, an investor needs to be vetted out, such as an accredited investor, and that's what a private placement uh, investor is, an accredited investor, is will now be prohibited under IRAs. Well, thank God that based on the lobbying of the industry, uh, before even Build Back Better, that was stripped out of the legislation. So in other words, it's 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 gone at this point all right so to answer your question no that's not a that's not a part of anything at all it didn't pass didn't even make it to any any bill so good news so for people who are private placement uh, uh, holders well guess what that's that's good news for you but there are ways to get around that piece as well because there are other types of retirement plans that IRAs can roll to which a taxpayer could still hold. But anyway, uh, at, at this point, there's there's no effects on IRAs at all. All right, I hope that answers your question. Next question, Andrew. Thank you. Next question. So Stephanie asks, who calculates the RMD? That's a good question. Who calculates the RMD? Financial institutions that have a fair market value balance, in other words, if you have a December 31st balance in the previous year, in other words, for, for tax year 2023, uh, so, so tax year 2022, to calculate your RMD for tax year 2022, uh, the, formula, uh, the formula prescribes that you use tax year 2021's fair market value. Now, as we went through the fair market value statement, if a custodian has the fair market value of an individual's IRA, which is December 31st, and they're providing you a fair market value statement, they should also provide you either an amount or offer to calculate your RMD for you. To answer your question, if you have a fair market value, your custodian can assist you in calculating the RMD. Now, let's say you transferred your IRA from one institution to another. Well, of course, the receiving institution would not have the fair market value from your prior custodian. So if, if you've lost your, your statement, from your previous custodian, well, there, it's not the end of the world. That's why I gave that website, investor.gov. Investor, it's like you're an investor. Investor.gov is a government website that actually has a tab that says calculators. And in that calculator, it can actually assist you in calculating RMDs as well if you wanted to calculate it or are, are needing to calculate it yourself. So generally, it's the custodian's responsibility. However, 
if you want to calculate it yourself, there is a calculator under a government website from the SEC called investor.gov. All right, next question, Andrew. I hope that answers your question. Great. Next question. So I have set up an SDIRA in 2021 and set up an LLC to buy property in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, their Entrust dashboard shows an FMV for the LLC. So the question is, do I need to submit a form uh, for Entrust regarding this LLC FMV? Yes. Um, the the question is, um, uh, you have this person has a self-directed IRA with the Entrust Group invested in an LLC. The LLC invested in property in Mexico. Does the Entrust Group need to have an FMV of all the properties that are owned by that LLC? Uh, under you know uh, under that L L LLC which is uh, under their IRA the answer is yes then 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 we can report properly to the IRS the value of the LLC it's not going to be taxed but it's just going to be you know it's required by law because they they track these these amounts uh, to make sure that they write legislation appropriately it's not going to get taxed by you reporting as the fair market value but at least we have the correct amount being reported under your IRA by providing us that fair market value of that LLC. So to answer your question, yes, we would need that fair market value. Great, thank you. Next question. Which tax year will a contribution made in 2022 be counted against? Uh, a contribution made in tax year 2022 would generally be reported in tax year 2022, unless, the taxpayer tells the custodian that this is for a prior year. So in other words, between January 1st and April 15th of tax year 2022, if somebody makes a contribution and notates in writing to the financial institution, this is for a prior year, then the, um, then the custodian will report that for the prior year. But it, but it, has, to be, uh, it has to be stated in writing. The, the uh, interest group is what we call a deposit coupon. And one of the questions in the deposit coupon is, what year is this contribution for? If you put the right year, then we will report that in the appropriate year to report it on the right, on the correct IRS form 5498. But if there's nothing uh, stated in writing, then the custodian will just report it in the year that it's received, because they won't guess, right? So they'll just report it in the year that it's received. Actually, temporary treasury Temporary Treasury Regulation 1.219 is where you will find that guidance from the uh, Internal Revenue Service that it has to be in writing, correct? And, that, and that's why we have a deposit coupon that is used to state the year that the contribution is for. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. All right. I'm looking for my 1099 on my website, but there is no form. Do you know when that will be available? Yes. Uh, 1099 R's are not uh, basically made available until January 31st of the year following the calendar year. Similar to your W-2, if you work for somebody, their W-2 is generally not due until January 31st. Some of them may provide it earlier, but the ultimate deadline is January 31st. So once all the 1099 R's are issued, which should be on or before January 31st, that would be the time frame that you need to be looking for that IRS Form 1099 R. It's coming. It's coming soon. That's next. That's next week, right? Yeah. Great. Next question. So, suppose you don't make a new distribution this year, but would still like to move money from one type of an IRA to another. I think that's called a rollover. Do we still have until April fifteenth to do that type of redistribution? Uh, the actual transaction that you're talking about is actually what we call a recharacterization. If, I'm assuming that you're talking about a current year contribution made in 2021, and you wanted to move that, let's say, from a traditional to a Roth or a Roth to a traditional, and it can be done by up until your tax return due date of April 15th plus extensions, which puts us in October 17th of 2023, since October 15th falls on a weekend or a holiday. The, the 1099R on that will not show up until tax year 2023 if you recharacterize in tax year 2022. So in other words, you can still move it. The 1099R will not show up for tax year 2021, but for tax year 2022, 
and will not be issued until tax year 2023. That's why there's two different codes on a 1099-R when you do what we call a recharacterization. One is a uh, code R, which is your scenario. If you recharacterize last year's contribution to a one from one type of an IRA to another, words, in other words, you're you're retroactively changing that contribution from one type of IRA to another. The code R would show up on the 1099-R, and what that will tell the IRS is, oh, you recharacterize it, okay, no taxation, but where did you end up? Which means you should have what we call an IRS form 5498 from the receiving IRA that received that recharacterization. In other words, the amount that was distributed, the amount was also contributed to another type of IRA, and that should be the offsetting entry. Yeah, but there will be a 1099-R. That's why the IRS says keep your tax records for a period of three years. Why? Because you, you could have essentially done a transaction in, say, in 2021, recharacterize it in 2022, but the tax forms will not show up until 2023. That's why they say keep your records for three years because they may not be finished looking at your tax rec your tax return for a period of three years to see the full picture. That's where that three years comes into play. But there will be a 1099-R in 2022 if you recharacterize. Thank you. Okay. Next question. I have an IRA backed with gold and silver. Purchased yep. in 2014 but not added since. Is this considered a self-directed IRA? Are there any implications I should know about? Nope, uh, it is considered a self-directed IRA. And if you've had gold in two, since 2014, all we're reporting basically is the fair market value of that gold. And that's it, it works the same for gold. It works the same for stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. It just so happens that the interest group can hold gold, whereas you go to Schwab, they're gonna say, we don't hold gold, or TD Ameritrade might say, we don't hold gold or bank or Wells Fargo that we don't hold gold. It says interest, the interest group holds gold. Well, it's still treated all the same as the same type of IRA. So the, the self-direction is just a marketing term for, for the, for the transaction that says, you know what, we don't offer any investments, but you can choose your own investment. In this case, you chose gold. So all the same rules apply to uh, all IRAs, including the self-directed traditional Roth, SEPs and simple IRAs and individual 401k self-directed accounts, all the rules and tax codes, so, uh, all of it applies. So good job holding gold. <laughs> Great, next question. As part of Biden's attempt to change tax laws in 2021, was he successful in raising the cap gains long-term rate? Is there some sort of 25% rate that went into effect in September? Lastly, must we keep track of exact dates for equity and real estate sales now? If you're talking about capital gains, uh, long-term and short-term capital gains, um, in the IRA, that does not exist. In, uh, in IRAs, if you bought a piece of property at 100,000 and next year you sell it at 200,000, it's kind of exaggerated, but I think you, you're gonna get the, you, you, I'm just trying to prove a point. If you bought an investment at 100,000, now it's worth 200,000. We're, we're generally, if it's outside an IRA, that 100,000 will be taxed either at short-term or long-term gains rate. In other words, if you held it for less than 12 months, uh, it's gonna get taxed as regular income, but if it's held more than uh, one year, then it'll either be taxed at zero or 15 or 22, depending upon what your level of income is, okay? That does not apply to IRAs. Why? Because an IRA is a tax deferred account. So if you bought a piece of property at 100 grand under your IRA and you sold it for 200 grand, that $100,000 gain has no taxation as long as it's kept under the umbrella of the IRA. Now, if you take a distribution, that, distrib that amount that you distributed will just be includable as taxable income in your tax return. So in other words, the Capital gains of, of Biden does not affect IRAs at this point. Yeah. Great, thank you. And and and, and, I, and I'm not sure if it, it increased. At, and looking at the tax forms from last year, it's still you know if you make from zero to eighty some odd thousand for a married couple filing a joint tax return, uh, there's no taxation. But the moment it goes all the way up to four hundred thousand, tax at fifteen percent. That that doesn't apply to IRAs. I, I didn't see any change in tax year two thousand twenty one. Great. Next question. Do you still have to take 
beginning distributions from an IRA at age 70? You, the, the age 70 and a half for required minimum distributions have been increased to age 72 with the passage of what we call the SECURE Act of 2019. So after 2019, uh, the age for required minimum distributions is now age 72. So it's no longer 70 and a half, it's age 72. Great, thank you, JP. Next question. If I have an employer-sponsored Roth 401k and an SDIRA, am I able to contribute to the SDIRA? Uh, the, the contribution to uh, an individual 401k plan does not affect does not affect your IRA contribution limit. In other words, the amount you can contribute is not affected at all. The only thing that an employer-sponsored plan will affect is whether or not your traditional IRA contribution is deductible or not, depending upon your income. But as far as limits are, are coming to play, like for example, for tax year 2021, the maximum deferral is 19,500 plus an additional uh, 6,500, I believe, for, for as, as a catch-up. Well, that does not affect your contribution to a Roth IRA, for sure. I mean, you know, you, you, if you're under the age of 50, it's, you know, it's 6,000. If you're 50 and over, it's an additional 1,000. So the limits are not affected. The only thing it affects by participating, by having an employer-sponsored plan is your traditional IRA deductibility. Great, thank you. Okay, so for a loan made from a self-directed 401k, when can you make a repayment from that loan? Was it December 31st, 2021, or until the company files a tax return? Let me know if that When you sense. say a repayment, uh, I'm assuming, are you talking, uh, I'm assuming your question is about the COVID distributions. If it's a COVID distribution, go ahead, Andrew. I was just going to say, is Diego, a, oh, thank you. Diego was clarifying, yes, that's exactly what he Okay, means. great. Thank you, Diego. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So if you took a, a distribution of 100,000, number one, there should have been an IRS form 8915E that needs to be filed with your tax return. That's what, that would state what your plans are. In other words, if you're going to, um, if you're going to uh, uh, prorate the taxation of that distribution into three years, which a law allows, that's where the 8915 comes into play. Maybe we will also have an 8915F and 8915G. In other words, so at least the, the IRS can make sense of what you're trying to do. If an amount is repaid, then the 8915 should reflect that. In other words, if we took it out, then it's not going to be taxable if you put it back within a, a certain amount of time. And, and the, the amount of time is uh, within the three-year repayment period. That's how it's all reconciled. That, that's that the, 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 the place that you would need to go to get assistance for completing that IRS form 8915, Diego, is uh, your competent tax advisor. When you file your tax return, that 8915E, as a matter of fact, Google it, then it'll show you the forms that need to be filed to keep track of the amounts that you've taken as a distribution. Now, why is it left to the taxpayer? Because you may have taken a distribution from this 401k plan, but that, that employer may not know that you took a distribution from someplace else as well. That's why the IRS says it's up to the taxpayer to reconcile that under tax return, right? So the repayment, the, the, the distribution, taxation, and repayment is all handled using the IRS form 8915E, yeah, for tax year 2021. But again, for tax year 2022, it may be 8915F at that point. So at least they can delineate the years. Great, thank you, JP. Yes, sir. All right, everybody, if you have any more questions you would like for us to get to before we jump today, please submit them now. We'll give about 30 seconds here, and then JP will wrap us up. All right. If there if there, there are no further questions about, uh, sorry, okay. the webinar recording, sorry, JP, um, Mike, can no, answer your questions? Uh, yes, this webinar is being recorded, as are all of our webinars, just so you know for future reference. 
we will be posting the video replay and sending that to you in an email along with the audio mp3 and the presentation pdf that should come to your email if not tomorrow the following day and i'll be posting the replay today in our learning center thank you very much everyone jp please take us home all right <laughs> or sorry, Vivek, right, you well, have one question. Sorry, sorry, one question okay. here once it comes in. All right. Um, what year, sorry, if we contribute to SEP from an S Corp in 2022, what year will it count towards? Thank you, Vivek. Well, it, it depends upon what you're, you're, you're trying to get the deduction for. So if you, want, you, if you are basing the contribution amount for tax year 2021, the contribution will be reported in tax year 2022. Al although it's reported in tax year 2022, you can still use that as a tax deduction for 2021. And depending upon your entity again, so if you're a S Corp or partnership, your deadline would have been March 15th this year. And if you applied for an extension, your deadline would be September 15th. So it gives you a little bit of time to make that decision. If you are an S Corp, if you are a C Corp or a sole proprietor, your de deadline is April 15th and up until October 17th of tax year 2022. But you can still use that contribution that you made and tell the IRS that I'm, that I'm using this for tax year 2021. The reason why the IRS uh, said that the deadline to make a contribution is your tax return due date plus extensions is some organizations don't even know how much they made for the year. So how can you make a, a step contribution or a profit sharing contribution if you don't even know how much profit you have? So the deadline really is the tax return due date plus extensions of an employer so that they can determine whether or not if you've made profit, then shelter a portion of that profit or, or your income into a, on a retirement plan and get to keep it, right? So, so that's why the deadline is the tax return due date plus extensions of an employer. Great. And they're clarifying that's still the case even though the S Corp has cash accounting? Uh, even the S Corp, even though the S Corp has cash accounting, that just determines your level of income and expenses for that time frame. The contribution to uh, um, uh, a retirement plan is just used as a tax deduction for that time frame. So you know, it, it doesn't affect just because you're cash accounting. It doesn't it doesn't affect it? Not at all. Great. Thank you, you have for clarifying, yeah, Jason. Yeah. yeah. So if you make a hundred thousand, and let's say the maximum twenty five percent. 25,000, how would you like to take 25,000 and reduce your $100,000 taxable income by 25,000, put it in an account for yourself and get to keep it, you're only taxed on 75. It's kind of a simplistic illustration. There's more detail to that. That's why a tax advisor is very important, but you can shelter a, a ton of cash. Great, and two more questions popped in actually as you were answering that, if you don't mind. Okay, no, not at Great. all. <laughs> awesome, so two here, Olivia asks, how do we set up a SCP with interest for a sole proprietor? Oh, okay. Uh, how do you uh, uh, set up a simplified employee pension plan? Uh, one of two ways. You can either just download the document uh, from the IRS website. It's called a simplified employee pension plan. Or you can use one of our simplified employee pension plan documents from the Entrust website. Uh, on the top right-hand corner, uh, on, the, on, the, on the tabs on the top, I don't know if you call that tabs or or they, they have a special but anyway the it says forms click on forms and download the simplified employee pension plan document and then from there once you sign that document you have a set plan and by establishing a set plan then you can make the contributions that we're talking about yeah simple as that <laughs> thank you very and you much also have to have a, and, and by the way you also have to have a traditional ira to receive the contribution because a set the SEP, establishing the SEP plan is the employer's contribution. It, it defines what the rules are and how the plan works. But the ultimate um, vehicle that receives the contribution is what we call a SEP IRA. It's nothing more than a traditional IRA to receiving a uh, SEP contribution. So when you're establishing the IRA to receive that contribution, it's called a SEP IRA. Great. Thank you, JP. Mm -hmm. All right. Last question here. I did a full Roth conversion in December 21. There are still dividends coming to the old account. Are those supposed to go directly to the Roth account? Or sorry, are they going directly to the new Roth account or the old account? Where are they supposed to flow uh, to? Well, if you have a traditional IRA that you converted, 
only the amounts that were in that IRA that were distributed, in other words, converted from a traditional to a Roth, because the year of the distribution uh, determines the year for which the, con the conversion took place, are, are the only amounts reported uh, as taxable to the Roth. If there are subsequent dividends coming to that traditional, those have to be converted as well because those earnings were earned by the traditional IRA amounts that were in that IRA at the time. So in other words, those have never been taxed, therefore have not been converted. So it would have to flow to the traditional first, distributed and converted a second, uh, as, as your second conversion. In other words, your, your trailer conversion, because those particular dividends have never been taxed before. So it cannot flow to the Roth directly. It has to flow to the traditional and then convert it to the Roth. Great. Okay. One came in that's a bit larger, JP. So I know you won't mm -hmm. be able to cover this entirely, but just if you could give your two cents. Um, Olivia okay. asks, how do you buy real estate with an SDIRA? Um, we have, oh, we've done okay. big sessions on this, and I know this is very complex. Yeah. But if you just have any yeah. kind of overarching views on this, that would be awesome. Yeah, it's very simple. It's just like buying any any property. It's just, it's just that uh, buying a piece of real estate involves certain roles. So in other words, if you have the money in your SEP IRA or traditional IRA or Roth IRA, whatever it may be, let's say you have enough money to buy the piece of property. All you need to do is engage with um, the interest group and fill out what we call a buy direction letter. It's a, it's a letter of authorization for your custodian to be directed to purchase a piece of investment. In other words, you, you located the investment that you want to purchase. Well, first of all, that it's not you buying the investment, it's your IRA buying the investment. So therefore, the naming convention of the purchaser of that property must be your IRA. Let me give you an example. Interest group for the benefit of Olivia's traditional IRA. That would be a, a good example since Olivia was the one asking the question. From there, the, pur the purchaser being your IRA must also provide what we call a down payment. So therefore, that's where the interest group is also notified that you, you want us to send a portion of your cash in your IRA as a down payment for that property. So therefore, it would be paid to the realtor at this point, which will eventually be passed on to an escrow company. The escrow company would, of course, uh, would run the title work on a piece of property to make sure there's no uh, liens on the property, as an example, or encumbrances on the property to make sure it's clean. From there, the escrow company will notify the interest group working with what we call our real estate department. And there is a fee for it. It's a small fee. It's not as quite as much as what the escrow companies charge, but we do have to pay our personnel that's handling the particular transaction. And what they would do is work with the title company to fund the purchase of that property. Of course, uh, the amount will be uh, given to us by the, the escrow company, and then we will send that amount uh, via wire or a check, or most of the time it's a wire for the escrow company. And then from there, the escrow com company re-records the title of that property under your IRA's uh, name. And from there, your IRA owns that property at that point. Of course, buying a piece of property has additional expenses to it, such as property taxes, so on and so forth. You need to make sure that there's enough cash in the IRA to pay those expenses. Why? Because those cannot be paid out of pocket because it's the IRA that owns the investment. So there must be enough money uh, cashed for property taxes or if there's any maintenance on that property. And of course, if it's a rental property, there should be income uh, being paid to the interest groups, your interest groups IRA because that, that's the earnings on that particular investment. I hope in a nutshell, I gave you a, a high level uh, scenario on how to purchase real estate using an IRA outright with cash inside your IRA. Mm -hmm. Thank you, JP. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of to piggyback off that, um, David asks, in addition to the cash you just mentioned, are there other popular uh, financing methods for real estate? Yes. Because it is an SDIRA and there are you know, mm -hmm. a, fair limit, a fair amount of limitations. Yes. And who uh, well, qualifies for a loan? Sorry. Thank you, David. Well, well, David, yes, there, there are strategies around that. You could either partner with somebody that as long as the other person is, uh, I mean, the, the cleanest way is that they're not, they're not what we call a disqualified person. Let's say a friend, uh, a brother who is not a lineal ascendant or lineal descendant. Um, you know, multiple partners, multiple friends that could partner with your IRA to purchase that property. That's one way to finance it. 
Another way to finance it is what we call a non-recourse loan, which by the way, the interest group has a list of non-recourse loan lenders. Given the fact that you personally cannot extend credit, loan money to your IRA, or use any of your personal uh, funds or credit to purchase that property that your IRA is going to own, it has to be it has to be an arm's length transaction between you, right, and the IRA. So therefore, the IRA has to qualify for the loan. Non-recourse loan lenders have different underwriting guidelines. Number one, they have to have a little bit more skin in the game, so the down payments are a little bit higher. The lowest one that I've found in our list, because we don't we don't we don't uh, endorse any of them. But I did find that one of them, the lowest down payment is 35%. So if you want to buy a $100,000 piece of property, all you need is $35,000. That's, that's a pretty good deal. Now, assuming, uh, let's also assume that the property that you're purchasing has uh, income. In other words, rental income. Because the lender is not going to lend you any money unless that IRA can actually pay it back. right? So those underwriting guidelines are a little bit different. Loan to value is a little bit different. Uh, and they, they need to make sure that your IRA can sustain what your IRA is entering into because they don't want to foreclose. That's the last thing they want to do. They just want to be able for you to be successful with that investment that you're investing in. So there are many strategies, but the most common ones are partnering with other people or you get a non-recourse loan. And the, uh, the interest group does have a non-recourse loan list of non-recourse loan lenders. And we've talked about in the IRS Form 990-T uh, needs to be filed for a portion of that income that is being received from the portion that has been borrowed because that amount is taxable. So in other words, there is a procedure, procedure that the IRS already has that you must follow. So which means, yeah, people are doing this all over the place. So. Thank you, JP. Mm -hmm. We have two more that came in. So number one, okay. <laughs> yeah. do you have any opinions on if it's better to buy real estate with an LLC versus not for the sole ability to write checks and have that kind of control? <clears throat> well, the IRA cannot have a checking account, so most individuals would basically set up an entity and the IRA invests in that entity. Since that is an entity, like an LLC, they could write checks. Um, there are benefits to that. Um, I would highly recommend that the general manager of that LLC not be the IRA holder to avoid conflict of interest. But some people seem to think that they can be the general manager of that LLC as well. But that's up to you, between you and your legal counsel. I, I would highly recommend having somebody else be the general manager to avoid a conflict of interest. But if you want to name yourself, that's completely up to you. There are advantages to an LLC. Why? Because if the LLC buys 10 properties, the record keeping fee on that particular uh, investment is only one record keeping fee because the interest group will only be administering one, the LLC. If you had 10 properties under an, uh, an IRA, then we would charge you 10 properties. So number one, there's a cost savings already. And the other one would be something that I mentioned already. You may have check cutting uh, privileges for that LLC, which kind of gives you a little bit of a, an advantage when it comes to an auction or offering cash to a distressed property or a distressed seller uh, that may say, you know what, instead of 100 grand, I'll take 82. I mean, so you, you have more flexibility, but there is more record keeping for the IRA holder when you have an LLC. Why? Whatever happens in the LLC must flow back to the IRA. You can't just cut a check to yourself. Uh, that would be tax evasion because you're, you're not using the custodian. So to avoid that, any incomes must fall, must, that incomes that, received, that is received by the LLC must flow back to the IRA, and any expenses must also be paid from the IRA. So in other words, you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, um, supplement any ex expenses that are being paid out of pocket. Because keep in mind, it's not you that owns it, it's the IRA. So there are advantages and disadvantages to both. but. Um, you know, um, it's up to you based on what you want to what you want to do to accumulate wealth. Because keep in mind, just because you have an IRA invested in real estate doesn't mean you're going to make money. But it is a vehicle that a lot of people have used to accumulate wealth. Right. Thank you, JP. All right, last one I'm seeing here. Can I take more than the RMD amount when taking an annual RMD, as stated in the RMD calculator? 
you can always take out on a, a larger than the minimum. The minimum is the only amount that's required to avoid the 50% penalty. But you can always take it on a lot larger. You can take the whole thing if you wanted to, but uh, there is no penalty for that, not at all. Great, thank you very much, JP. And that brings us to the end of the questions. So you can now wrap Great. this up. All right. Well, thank you again for uh, staying connected with us and um, being patient with all the information that I just, uh, you know, feel like I'm presenting out of a fire hose. But you need this information. Again, it's recorded and feel free to uh, contact us if you have any questions. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to having you again in another interest group webinar. And and um, give us some other ideas of topics that you, you need as a, an investor. And we, we'd be more than happy to provide that in one of our webinar sessions. Again, thank you again. My name is John Paul Ruiz, Director of Professional Development here at the Entrust Group. And looking forward to having you again in one of our webinars. Goodbye.